Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and um, I'll have everyone go ahead and introduce themselves. Well, I'm Matt. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> You're one of your hosts here on Really Dicey. Big Star Trek fan. Happy to talk to these Trekkies here. My name is Jim Johnson. I'm the project manager for Modifius Entertainment Star Trek Adventures RPG. I've been involved with the game from the beginning, so going, going on five years now. And uh, excited to be here. I love you guys. Love the show you're doing. Thank you so much for your support of the game. So excited to be talking today. Hi, I'm Kelly Fitzpatrick. I am a uh, writer of science fiction, and I won the Star Trek Strange New Worlds contest in 2016. And I am thrilled to be uh, a contributing writer to Star Trek Adventures. And I'm uh, Derek Tyler Attico. Um, thank you for having me back. Uh, I am also a uh, winner of the Star Trek Strange New Worlds and contributor to Star Trek Adventures, and I'm thrilled to be here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Q. Um, there was <laughs> news that's been released that Picard Season 2 will have the return of Q, uh, aka John Delancey. And just to share with everyone, John Delancey is the only actor I approach. Now, I, I've been going to cons since 2002, and I've seen many of these Star Trek actors are, make their appearances there. And I've always been too shy to just go and ask for an autograph. But John Delancey, I love Q so much, I went, I actually braved enough, broke my shyness to go up to John Delancey and grab a picture with him. I just had to. Uh, I, I, I loved uh, uh, his appearances in Star Trek Next Generation, uh, as well as Deep Space Nine and, and Voyager have always been fantastic. He's just a fantastic actor, but portrays, portrays it very well. And I, I'm just excited that uh, he'll be in Picard. Um, uh, season two. Um, so uh, I, I brought this this great team together to talk about Q and Star Trek Adventures. Um, uh, how do you role play or use Q and Star Trek Adventures by Modifius? Um, so um, my first question, and I'll start with I'll start with Kelly. Um, uh, what does uh, and this is for everyone? But I'll start with Kelly. Uh, what does what does Q mean to you? So in the shows, Q has always represented to me Star Trek's um, attempt to sort of get its, uh, to play with the idea of omnipotence and, and maybe even like divinity, um, not necessarily in a religious sense, but just in the sense of uh, what happens when there are beings who can do almost anything uh, and who can sort of just impress their will on the galaxy and, and the beings who are there. and. Uh, the answer is, of course, very complicated, and and sometimes it's that uh, trouble ensues, and you know it ends up being not ethical, it ends up being hilarious, uh, it ends up being dangerous and catastrophic. Like you know, uh, sometimes the things that happen as a result of Q's presence uh, are some of the greatest storytelling um, in Star Trek. And other times, I'm like, are you serious? Like, what is he doing right now? <laughs> so I I think it it runs the gamut of uh, as a storyteller, uh, Q, and, and I mean Q in the sense of um, their their entire you know species, not just the character played by John Delancey, they offer an opportunity to really explore uh, the idea of power uh, in not just in the show, but then when you try to transfer an entity like that into a game like STA, um, that where power really really matters, <laughs> um, fun things happen. Okay, uh, Derek. Well, you know what? Like you, I've always loved Q. And uh, the first Star Trek story I wrote was called Alpha and Omega. And I, I actually tried to answer some of those questions about Q. Um, who was he? Why was he here? What was he always doing with Picard and humanity? What was the why behind that? You know? And because we had this omnipotent being and we never answered, and, and he was always used, as Kelly said, he was always used as a storytelling point, but why was he actually doing the things he was doing? And I think this ties directly into role-playing the character because I'm sure GMs will use the character for whatever means, but if you want to delve deeper into the character himself and why he and the Q Continuum are using the speck of a species like humanity, why? You know, so I, I wrote a, um, that and I try to answer some of those questions. So if anyone is interested in that, they might want to take a look at that. And and I, I think even if you don't take a look at it, I think that's something that the GM and players who want to ask themselves to use the character Q because he's this omnipotent, omnipotent creature and he can do whatever. He can't be harmed in STA. He can create whatever in STA, 
But what are his motivations? Because as that independent being, he has to have those motivations. And those were some of the questions I tried to answer. And I think on some level, that's some of the questions that the, the players might want to delve into and the GM might want to think about when they play that omnipotent character, not just have him there as a crux to move a story forward, if that makes any sense. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Jim. Uh, so Q, I, I always thought Q was an interesting character because it, it gave us another way to get a perspective on Picard, especially like Picard and, um, and some of the other characters, right? Because, because uh, you know, Q as, a, as an antagonist, you know, can, you can do like literally like it's such a great writer tool because you can do absolutely anything you want with Q because he can go forward in time. He can go backwards in time. He can go sideways in time. He can throw you, you know, the Borg before you're even ready for it. And it just as a test, right, to say, hey, are you ready for this? Do you think you're really ready for this? Look at this. This is what's waiting for you out there. And 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 then you get to see how the characters react to that. And I think, um, you know, having having Q do that kind of stuff is is an interesting challenge for a group. I, I mean, as a GM, I think I would be hesitant to use it only because we've seen it done so well on screen. I'd be like, uh, you know, you, you, to you to use Q really effectively, I think you would really need to tie it to one of the characters and I think the John Delancey Q, I mean, did that really well with Picard, right? And and, and Janeway to some extent too. I think the the DS9 episode was probably a, a missed opportunity for Q. Although I did like seeing how how the, the you know seeing the contrast between like how Picard reacted to him and how Cisco reacted to him, right? Cisco punched him in the face and then Q mm -hmm. left, and that was the end of it, right? So that's <laughs> I mean that's how you deal with a bully some, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. But uh, I think you know the Q, you know John Delancey's Q, I think he was there. Um, and I mean, honestly, it was just a really interesting kind of uh, perspective because you got this omnipotent, you know, omniscient being. It's like Derek was saying, like, what's his motivations? Like, why did he do this? Is he bored? Is he lonely? I mean, I'm sure he's terribly lonely, right? So, like to be able to do literally anything you want, anytime you want. I mean, where's the limit, right? I mean, what's the challenge to life? You're just kind of like hanging out and waiting. And it makes <laughs> me think of that one episode where there wasn't there in Voyager, there was a Q who wanted to commit suicide because they were just they were just done right it's like what's the what's the challenge what's the point and so you get to see if a, a, a perspective on picard because like picard faces down this omnipotent omniscient person and like you know really intrigues the guy to the point where he keeps coming back you know season after season <laughs> and then in the season you know in the series finale you know does that whole big that whole big thing and you know says that uh, humanity's never that, you know, the trial's never over, right? And now we're going to get to see him again in, in Picard. And I'm, I'm really curious to see what they do with him in Picard. I know that's going off off the question here, but uh, really. I think as, as a GM and as a writer, I would use Q as uh, as a way to um, challenge the players, characters, like morality mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, capability of getting into trouble that they really have no idea, like getting him way, way over their heads even more than they normally would. And then just seeing what happens. And then if they totally screw it up, well, you know what? Q can snap his finger and everything's back to normal. But those players learned, or those player characters learned a lesson though, didn't they? <laughs> so, I mean, yes. I, think, I think you'd have to do it with the right group though. I think to drop that on a group in like the first episode or something, I think that would be way too hard. Or like at a convention experience, I think that's asking for a lot of trouble. Okay. Well, we'll get, we'll get to more about that. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> but, um, but let me, uh, let me pass it to Matt. Mm -hmm. Well, um, now I've read the, um, the Star Trek adventure books. Um, did I miss it? Did you guys, is Q in any of those books? Did you guys mention Q? Are there God forbid stats for Q? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the science, the, the science division book has a, has a couple, has a chapter about Q and about, oh, okay. about using the Q in your game. And then the uh, the PDF uh, pack we did for iconic villains. Uh, it was a little PDF pack with eight different characters in it. Uh, there was a Gorn and Khan, and uh, Chang and Q and a few oh, others. So Q Q was statted up in there, you know, wow. in as much as he can be statted up, right? I mean, yeah. we, we maxed out his statistics, and then gave him some specific talents that said, you know, basically Q can do what he wants, and and uh, he's there to cause trouble. And uh, uh, so I mean, he has statistics, but like you know, functionally you can't hurt him, you yeah. can't kill him. You can simply challenge him and be challenged by him, and so we we did throw we did throw him in there. Yeah. Oh, okay. I I, I must have missed that. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> well, that's good to know. That way, our our 
people that are watching this and then they want to uh, see some stats or some information, they know where they can go. Um, so uh, so I'll, I'll ask, I'll go ahead and ask each of you again. Um, uh, uh, so how, how would, I mean, uh, Jim Ray started uh, in a sense, but how would you, if, you're, if your players wanted you to use Q in, in, the, in, in the, the, your next adventure, uh, how would you do so? I'll have uh, Kelly go first. Uh, I think uh, Jim's point about challenging morality is really um, key, and I even think it's it's a great opportunity to have like a thought experiment or to really uh, drill down on like a philosophical concept. So players who really like the thinky type um, Star Trek, mm -hmm. I think, would have a blast uh, in a Q episode. And um, that that one that Jim mentioned is. Um, death wish where they're sort of analyzing you know like should a should a being basically have the rights uh over whether or not they they want to be alive um and so it, it every time q shows up there's a, an ideal or a a value that star trek takes for granted that he just cracks wide open and says well why like what you know what if what if it's not what if it's this other thing um, and so I think it's an opportunity to really um, explore those things. Uh, it's also like a, a really, you know, deus ex machina way to do time travel. <laughs> if you want your players to, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to, to exact that in the Star Trek universe, but I think it's a rather fun way of he can just snap you to, to different places and different times, you know, uh, immediately. Um, and so those are, those are two ways that I can think of that you could easily you know, design a scenario. Okay, uh, Derek? Uh, I, I agree with what Jim and Kelly said. And I think I would add to that, the, the times that's been most interesting for me watching Q and watching him, uh, I guess, um, play against other people in the show is, is when he challenged Starfleet and the Federation's hubris right? Like in the beginning when he was like, you don't know what your people are doing. These people shouldn't be out, of here, be out here. And when he sent them to, to meet the Borg, he was really challenging hubris. He's like, you know, you think you know everything. You think you've reached the pinnacle of a certain level and <laughs> you're not even close, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's a great place to kind of start, especially if you have players that have been playing a while and they're doing really well in the campaign and things are just rolling along. And, you know, <laughs> then there's this cue that says, mm, no, there's something else out there or there's something I want to show you that's that's not um, what you can handle. Another thing that I think would be really great is the personal story and 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 character is story plot and the plot is always char character is plot and plot is character, right? So in a campaign, the beautiful thing of having campaigns, is, as, as we all know from playing, is that these, you know, your players will develop characters with quirks and with values and Q can challenge those. He can, you know, maybe maybe one guy is a is a is a, a great uh, captain, um, but not a good person, you mm -hmm. know. And maybe there's a way to use Q to play that, or maybe there's a, a way to um, go back in the character's history and bring back someone that that was that that was lost in a in a Wolf three five nine that the that the character knows. I mean, there's so many things you can do personally, and use Q as that crux point to say, who are you as a character? If I give you this thing, will it change you? Um, and really quick, one of the points of, of Picard, the first season was really regret. He had a lot of regret, a lot of, a lot of regret about a lot of different things he didn't do in the 20 years since he stopped being a, you know, a captain. And I'm sure it's gonna come up and I'm sure he was gonna say, hey, what if I give you those 20, 30 years back? Hmm. What would you do with that? You know, and so that's those are the kind of questions you can pose to characters. I think that would be really exciting. Jim, I know you sort of answered it before. Was there, is there anything you want to expand upon? Um, yeah, I mean, just listening to y'all. I mean, I, the, the ideas are firing off, and <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful about how much I say because I might want to use it in my game. But uh, <laughs> I think the, the, the one the one thing I definitely would not do as a game master is I, I don't think I would. Uh, it's really hard because it's like on the one hand I don't want to use the John Delancey cue because he's so well known and he's so familiar and he's mm -hmm. so tied to Picard, especially I'd hate to like, like pull him into my game and say, Oh, you know, you got the cue, the John Glancy cue. And it's like, Oh, well that guy. So I would probably want to use a different cue mm -hmm. from the, from the continuum. Cause like we know the continuum is a thing, right. And, and there's a whole society built around it. And I would want to make sure that that cue 
was really tied into at least one of the characters, one of the player characters, because otherwise it's just it's just a one off like, oh, we met Q and OK, great. We check that box and then we move on to the next thing. <laughs> I, I'd want that to be a recurring character and to have that that deep relationship with at least one character. Um, but what I'd really want to do, I think, because we haven't really seen this, and I bet we're going to see some of it in Picard, I, that's just my guess, is that I would really like to, to do a deep dive into their into their culture and, like, what makes the Q tick? Like, what what is it about the Q that makes them who they are? Like, why do, you know, do they care about the rest of the universe? If not, why? If they do, then why? You know, what, what made the Delancey Q reach out to Picard and do stuff, you know, are there others like that, that would do that thing? Or have they like, you know, are they like devoted to not getting involved? You know, like they, do they have like the ultimate non-interference? Are, are they like the Federation on steroids, right? Where it's like, <laughs> we're not going to interfere no matter what, you know, we don't care, you know, you, you're going to die, they're going to live, whatever. Uh, so I would, I would love to get, I mean, this is almost like a season's worth of, I mean, maybe, I mean, hell, you could probably do a whole campaign around it, right? Is to get the player characters deeply involved in the Q, um, you know, the whole Q continuum and the whole society and it's like, and like really dig down into that, but also make it really, really relatable to the characters. And I think the way to do that is to do what Q did to Riker and tempt him with the opportunities. Like I can make you a Q if you want, or, sure. or make you make you a quasi Q, you know? Okay. So player, you know, you can do literally anything you want you know test your values right like yeah. that's a great value <laughs> that's test that's like good. what do you yeah, and good. then you not only do you give them all the crazy powers but then you throw a moral dilemma in their way and make them have to choose between you know you got two people you really care about one's going to die one's going to live and you got the power to do something about it so what do you do wow yeah and 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 really screw it up but i think again you need the right the right group of characters or the right group of players and and you need to have a certain level of trust between the players and the gm that you're not going to like really screw them up, you know, that things are going to work out. But uh, I think that's what I would do with it um, or do with Q anyway. But even then, you know, just me as a GM, I think we've seen Q done really well on this on the TV shows. And it's the same thing with the Borg. Honestly, the Borg have been so well used in Next Gen and Voyager that I, I'm hesitant to do a Borg story other than as a one off because it's like, well, you know, we've got we've got 50, 60 episodes worth of Borg stuff that like, OK, w w there's no other story there. I yeah. have to do some digging to think about what kind of story I would do with it. Actually, um, I just I, I had an idea. I have a question for for Derek. Um, how do you think Q would play in a Klingon game? <laughs> oh wow! That's good. Oh, wow! <laughs> I, you know, like you do the Klingons. <laughs> no, that's a great that's a great question because they have this sense of honor, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Wow, off the top of my head, the first thing I would I would want to think about if I was running the game is like, why is he even there? Um, and why is he messing with the Cleons? And they have this sense of honor. So I, I think if I was running it, I could see him. Um, and if we had like Cleon players, I could see him trying to mess with their sense of honor and morality. Because the thing that always got me about Cleons is they say that the honor that they have, they have like a, a face of honor that they have. And oh, we're so, you know, we're so proud to be this thing. But, but sometimes when you push up against that, you see that there are sometimes it's just um, rhetoric. Sometimes it's just rhetoric that they use for themselves or, or for the empire. And it's just people grabbing power. Yeah. Now there are people in the empire like, like Worf and you know, like his brother that em embody and believe those things. But there are others that are just you know, going along to get the power. So mm -hmm. Q might be there in the sense to challenge a player and see if they are really honorable. Oh yeah. yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Or if they're just, yeah. you know, spewing the rhetoric of everyone else just to gain, you know, a place of, of power. So that's probably off the top of my head how I would use the character. That's a great question. Uh, would, would, uh, would Kelly or Jim like to uh, help answer that as well? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, um, <laughs> I'm picturing a Klingon crew being hella annoyed by you. <laughs> like, I, you know, like, like take, you know, the level of annoyance that we see in Picard and just like ratchet it up because he's literally the most patient person on the planet. And then like, try to, you know, have, uh, you know, a Martok character, like he's just gonna, the, the, I think they would have no patience for Q's shenanigans, but maybe they wouldn't have a choice. Um, you know, yeah, they, they'd have to square with that. 
Mm-hmm. No, I, I, yeah, that would be really interesting to see because you know I watched a couple of Q episodes today uh, just to get ready for this, and um, you know, and one Q was talking to Picard, and, and Worf literally kind of sidles up behind <laughs> him like he's going to take him by surprise, <laughs> and Q uh, and and Picard has to shoo him away, and you know, uh, have Worf lead the room. So yeah, a ship full of Klingons. You could get, you know, half the episode would be like a, you know, like a, um, a slapstick comedy of Klingons bouncing off of Q. Seriously, yeah. One of my favorite Q scenes is when he suddenly becomes human and he's on the the Enterprise or uh, yeah the Enterprise D bridge and and they don't believe him that he's mortal. Um, he's like, what can I do to convince you people? And Worf says, die. <laughs> Yeah. So that that's how I imagine the Cleon attitude toward Q. <laughs> yeah, you know, using using Q with the Klingon crew, I think it, it'd be a fun. I mean, it's, I mean, it's really just like using Q with the Starfleet crew. It's like it's testing their morality or testing testing their values, right? Like if you have a group of Klingon player characters, and they're like super focused on the we're honorable and this is the honorable thing to do, and we're in that very specific Klingon mindset, you you have you know you throw Q in there. And Q could present them with a with a moral dilemma or some sort of you know dilemma that like okay none of the choices you have in front of you are any way remotely honorable. What do you do? You've got to pick something. What do you do? And yeah. and how does that challenge your characters? And how does that challenge their their thought processes about what what is honor? Right? Because like honestly, if you watch enough Star Trek, every Klingon's got their own definition of honor. It's like oh, oh this yeah. is honorable, that's honorable, or whatever. And then even even Worf sometimes has very very specific nuances about what's honorable or not and it's like okay is there a, i mean it's not it doesn't seem to be codified like uh, maybe yeah. the fringy rules of acquisition right where fringies are like nope this is this is the rules of acquisition this is what we follow and the klingons are like yeah you know this is honorable that's honorable you're just honorable i'm just honorable whatever. <laughs> um, but, but to throw q into that now of course this also makes you think about like what's q's motivation Right. right, and that goes back to what Derek was saying about what what is the Q's motivation here? Why would the Klingon or why would a Q care about what a group of Klingons does? Right, there's got to be something at stake there that's important to the Q, yeah. and then and then that makes me think, you know, again going back to my thought about like what what makes Q the Q society tick? Like what would what could possibly be so important to a Q that they would be willing to interact with the Klingon crew to say, you know, are they are they like subtly asking for the Klingons' help? Like I need your help to do this, but I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to c- cover it up as a as a moral test for you. But you're actually going to be helping <laughs> me out. Like I I don't know. Um, there's so many ways you can do with that. And I mean I think as a game master, the nice thing about Q is like if things go way off the rails, and if you've saved up enough threat, <laughs> you can you can do the reversal right. The the little the little backdoor tr- trick that uh, Nathan built into the game, where if you have enough threat, you spend two threat for every player character in the scene. And you just completely change the circumstances, right? I mean, you're not you're not hurting the player characters, and you're not putting yeah. them into a more into an imminent threat or anything. You're just changing the the storyline completely. And if you do it right, I think it would be really nicely, you know, it'd be, it, it would play really well. If you use it as a crutch and you're like, oh no, you know what, that just didn't happen, and snap your fingers, then I think players are going to feel cheated. Yeah. But I think that might be a good way. So like, you know, if the if the queue had something that was really important to them, and they were desperate enough that they reached out to a crew of Klingons coming by. And then, you know, the Klingons, you know, for whatever reason, totally screwed it up. Then the Q could say, well, okay, that didn't work out. I'm going to snap my fingers. We're going to try it again or, you know, or something else. But uh, boy, now you got me thinking that a yeah. Q in a, in a Klingon game would be really, really crazy fun. Because it, it's something we haven't really seen yet, right? Yeah, hmm. ex- yeah, no, that, that's true. Yeah. We haven't. But um, the first thing that comes to my mind, uh, of course, is um, you could you could put the, the Klingons in an alternate setting like an alternate history you could switch the Uh, the script on them right the Uh, the Klingons are the conquered race or something Mm -hmm. and then see how they react to that that's what I love about the Q stories is they're they're kind of like Star Trek's what if you know those those one issue comic books Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) it's what if this had happened yeah it really does hinge on like inquiry that's tangible you know and I've always kind of thought maybe the, the name Q just looks like a question, you know, and, and it does seem like a lot of the interactions that Delancey Q has are more about asking questions than making points. Yeah. Um, and that's, 
that that's a really good point. I was just gonna say I, I love the idea of a of a what if. I mean, gosh, you could almost do a serious a whole ser a whole campaign around that, right? Uh, I mean, you have to figure out how to make the nuances work. But like, you know, what if the Q, you know, wiped out the profits and then just sat back and let the Dominion War happen, right? Or or what if the Q, <laughs> what if the Q introduced the Klingons to the Borg before they introduced the Federation to the Borg? You know, yeah. what would how would the you know what happens when the Klingons are the first line of defense for the entire Alpha and Beta quadrants? Or or uh, you know, what if the Q uh, I mean, gosh, yeah. you could go anywhere with it, but uh, uh, yeah. there's there's just so much storytelling potential there to, uh, oh, yeah. to play with, cause, partly because we have so many different omnipotent beings in the Star Trek universe, right? I mean, we got the Dwoud and the Q and the um, uh, the Guardian, of, and, yeah. Guardian of Forever. I mean, and the and the uh, prophets and everything else. I mean, there's what what if all those huge entities were caught up with the player characters and they ended up going to war with each other or something like what what would that look like <laughs> that'd be awesome it would that'd be crazy yeah, but yeah the, the great thing about the queue is you can do all this wild stuff yeah with your characters yep and then bring them back to the story when you're done yeah exactly yeah? <laughs> so yeah uh, endless um, potential you know i what's great also is that you could use q as a way to like um any like the old star trek novels uh like some that have some very incredible storylines some of them um and i uh i remember um talking to my wife and she's she's like a big reader of the old star trek like the, the old novels those uh the, the old paperback stuff and uh, i remember <laughs> and i remember watching the end of uh, star trek uh, discovery and i was i was telling telling my wife i don't know about like i don't want to spoil this for anyone that's seen it but uh when you find out what destroyed all the ships i was talking talking to my i was like i don't know it's like that seems really like in my like in my mind far-fetched but then she said well let me tell you about this novel and then this novel and it's like oh, like, oh my gosh <laughs> yeah uh, the novels were know. just yeah but if you're a fan <laughs> of those and you're not sure about how to maybe incorporate it that q is a, a great uh tool for that to happen mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, um, uh, another question I have is, what what advice could you give um, game masters um, so that when they um, play Q, they, they, how should I say it, they don't, um, I don't want to say this, I don't want to say play it the wrong way, but sometimes when you're playing a god, uh, your adventure could go really off the rails. Uh, but Star Trek is a very, uh, I don't want to say it, I don't want to say a serious role play game because the game is a game. It's meant to have fun, um, but there's there's it, it could be also used as a tool to talk about like like ethics and and, and aspects of morality and things like that. Um, it, in your opinion, is there is, is there uh, is there a a wrong way to use Q? Is it is there any advice you could give about that or thoughts? I'll have um, I'll have uh, Kelly go first. Well. I actually learned this from Jim, <laughs> um, and that is that in, in Star Trek role playing, the GM is not an adversary to the players. They're, you're all working together to build a, a story collaboratively. So if, if you are going to play Q as an NPC, as the GM, you don't want to think about it like you're using your power against the players or to, to thwart the players. How can you use that power to draw out interesting drama and interesting plot points that your whole group can enjoy, you know, unpacking and, and working through together versus thinking about it in, in terms of, you know, uh, an adversarial thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek? That's a, that's a great point. Um, I think one thing that I would say, or something that I would say uh, for, for GMs, and I guess players are like, specifically GMs, is it's a Star Trek, it's called Star Trek Adventures, right? And and Modiphius and the, the, the writer's privilege to participate in Star Trek Adventures, we try our best to embody Star Trek. And that being said, look to how, the GM should probably look to how Star Trek portrays omnipotent beings, you know, because everyone, or every, you know, different shows will do omnipotent beings differently. But the Star Trek omnipotent beings, they usually fall on different, on certain sides. Like they, they have a theme to them. They have a plan or they're this belligerent or they're childlike, but there are these recurring themes, you know? 
And you, you, you don't want to give something that, that the players have necessarily seen before, but you just want to keep all that in mind when coming up with something new is that it is Star Trek. So you can always look to all those episodes um, with Omnipotent Beings. And there's quite a few now in every series um, and specifically for the Q, right? To see how they're played and, and their own moves and swings. And, and I'll go back to what I said originally, what is the, that God's original, what is their motivation? Mm -hmm. You know, that should always help. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jim? Yeah, I mean, you know, Grayson raised uh, some great points. I mean, really, in, in addition to that, um, I would say if you're going to use Q in your game, try to make sure that you're not focusing on just one player character and, like, Q is interacting with that player character to the exclusion of everybody else, right? It, it is a collaborative storytelling game. You probably have more than two players at your table with you. And, um, you know, whereas on the TV show, you know, Q, the Delancey Q was primarily focused on Picard and it was like mostly Picard scenes, even though every now and then there was a scene with Guinan or a scene with somebody else or whatever. Um, but like if I was in that game, right, the Picard player would be like, OK, you know, this guy's got all my attention. Um, I'd I would want to spread that wealth out a little bit as a game master and like get them inv all involved with the Q. And you actually asked a great question because I have a specific personal um, um, reference to this way back in the way back in the day before most of these RPGs were even around. Um, I I played my very first Star Trek RPG, and um, I was playing the captain. And the GM was a huge fan of John Delancey's Q character, right? Like huge fan. And this was back when Next Gen was on the air still. I, I think the third season was still going on. So I, I'm dating myself a bit, but uh, <laughs> I've, I've been playing Star Trek for a long time, really long time. But so anyway, he had this idea, the GM, uh, of having this Q type character. He didn't specifically call it Q, but it was a Q type character, right? Come onto the ship and was going to challenge us morally, right? And he completely latched onto my character. Uh, which was unfortunate because what he decided to do, he's like, okay, this character is going to play chess with your, with the captain. I'm like, okay, so we're going to play chess and he's going to challenge me back and forth or whatever. And what the GM did was a huge mistake. He actually pulled out a chess board and he and I started actually playing chess in the middle of this RPG. And I was so embarrassed because like there's four other players around the table and they're all sitting there like, we're actually going to watch you play chess with Jim for an hour or hour and a half or whatever, <laughs> along with some our role playing back and forth. I was like, we can't, I, I kept trying to find outs. Like, like, how do I get, how do I get him to cut the scene or change the scene or get somebody else to do something? And like the GM was like, no, you're going to play this game of chess with this character because he's trying to get, to get you to a certain point. And I'm like, but I don't, this isn't fun. I don't want to do this. <laughs> so, you know, please don't bring a real chess board to your RPG. <laughs> and please don't focus your omnipotent character on just one other player character because your other, the other, the other players at the table are going to be bored as hell. And oh. uh, uh, yeah, so that, it was not a great experience. And you know, I'm glad I moved on from that. But uh, uh, I would say if you're a game master, you know, get everybody involved. And also importantly, I think, you know, the other, uh, you know, Kelly and Derek will touch on this too, is like, make sure your players have an out, right? So like, even though they've got this omnipotent being they're dealing with, they've still got to have an opportunity to do something. Like they have to have some agency. Cause like, even though Q can do literally anything they want to do, the players still have to be able to step up and say, you know, our, our characters matter. And we have capabilities and abilities that can do stuff. And, you know, morally, we might be on a different level, but th there's still got to be a story there and a reason for the characters to potentially succeed. I mean, they could fail, right? But mm -hmm. there should always be an opportunity for them to succeed, no matter what they're faced up against, whether it's an omnipotent being or not, right? So I would I would say just remember what Derek was saying about, about how, um, or I think it was Kelly, I apologize, I think it was Kelly, who said that, you know, the game master is not the antagonist, right? You, you don't introduce Q to try to do a total party kill that that day and then just snap your fingers and say, oh, well, that was fun because that's just a power trip and nobody wants to see that happen at the game table. Um, so, you know, just have have fun with it and be willing to uh, to test your players, you know, morally, not so much, you know, stat wise or attribute wise or whatever, but like be willing to tell some really deep stories at the table because I think Star Trek, you know, can do that, right? We've seen that for 50 something years now. And uh, I, I think, uh, and I'll stop talking, I promise. <laughs> um, I think Q, again, is just one of those great ways to put a lens on the characters and, and show them either how, how far humanity has progressed in 300 something years or how far we still have to go or, or both at the same time, right? Because like, you know, you know, Picard is certainly an, an ideal, but certainly he has his flaws too, right? And I think, you know, throwing Q into that mix 
really kind of like puts a spotlight on both aspects of it. And there's just so much material material that you could do with that at a game table um, if the players are willing to go along with it, right? I mean, obviously you want to get your players buy-in. Um, Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> One last question for, for the panel, mm -hmm. um, including you, Matt. Um, <laughs> um, let's, let's end this with saying, with, with sharing out, what is your favorite Q moment? Um, uh, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, my, my, if, if you ask me what's my favorite moment, uh, it's definitely in the episode tap, uh, Tapestry, uh, season six. Uh, I love like, I mean, I love the whole episode, of course, but it's the, 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 the first five minutes where they're, they're, they're um, bickering with each other. I love that. And it's such great comedic timing with both of them. And, but the end, uh, the whole point of the episode, uh, uh, I know myself personally, there's, there's, I, I have like tons of regrets and I always think about what if I, would have moved someplace else. What if I would have been out of this situation? You know, uh, when I think about my younger years, uh, but then when I think of that, why I watched that episode, it makes me, you know, appreciate a little bit. Like, you know, yeah, uh, my times were hard, but it wasn't for all that. I wouldn't be where I'm at now. I wouldn't be with the people I am with now. Um, so that that to me is my my favorite key moment. And uh, I'll uh, go to go to Kelly again. Oh, this is this is hard to uh, to choose just one. I I think. It's a toss up between um, when he runs into Guinan and she basically is like, you know, he's not trustworthy, uh, get off, get off my ship. And it's just like these sparks between these two very old, very, you know, powerful, very knowing beings. Uh, I love Guinan and I would love, I would love a Guinan show. Uh, so I think that gives us insight into both Q and Guinan. Um, but the the end of i think it's the episode where where q is sort of sentenced to be mortal um the very end of that episode he kind of like we learns a lesson and and sort of maybe uh feels like his character is humanized in a way uh when when he's finally allowed back in and you know i i think that's an important moment for us to see that even god's um you know make mistakes and and grow as as people derek uh well i think i'm dating myself as well but i remember watching uh i think it was called q hugh q who when he first introduced him to the borg uh when it first came out and i remember that that end scene where he put the enterprise crew through all this hell you know like 17 or 18 members of the crew were killed and Picard was like, look, I understand the lesson. Please tell me this is not real. And he was like, no, this is this is real. This, you know, if, if you don't, if you can't take being out here, then go home. But this is real. And it at that moment, all of Q's shenanigans, for me at least, turned. And it felt more like a parent that was teaching a harsh lesson. And not necessarily a good parent, but but he was teaching a very harsh lesson to humanity, and and I, that always stuck with me. That this guy is he's doing some things that could be seen as cruel or harsh or whimsical, but there's something behind that, and he's trying to guide humanity, you know, in a certain direction. And that always stuck with me. Hmm. Uh, Jim, so my absolute favorite, I think, was uh, what Kelly said when when Q as no mortal meets Guinan and, you know, the Guinan takes the first opportunity she can to stab him with a fork and just to, <laughs> just to kind of like prove that he's mortal and that he can feel pain. And, you know, he's surprised. Right. And, and that's probably one of the few times that he's actually been surprised in his, you know, very incredibly long lifespan or whatever. Uh, so, but barring that one, um, I, I mean, I have to, I mentioned it earlier, but I think, I think it, it, you know, uh, whether or not putting Q on DS9 was the right idea for the for the producers and the developers, like, you know, who's to say, but um, I think they were maybe maybe trying to pull in some next gen crowd to uh, to check out DS9. But I, I really like seeing the different perspective on Q in DS9 just to say, let's put him up against Cisco and how is the character different? You know, and he was genuinely surprised right here. He is an, an immortal, you know, omniscient being and he got popped in the face by Cisco. And that changed that colored his perception, right? It colored his his reactions and stuff. and. It was kind of neat to see that you know a, a mortal can actually teach a an omnipotent immortal being a lesson once in a while. Um, and I wish we I wish we could have seen more with uh, with Vosh and Q because I think there's a lot of interesting potential there 
for a character like I mean like what's Q doing? What, why are you with Vosh? <laughs> and what's, and what's, Va, what's Vosh's story, right? Like what is she doing hanging around with him? Um, yeah. other, and like how do you you know is it possible to take advantage of an omniscient omnipotent being? <laughs> she was able to right somehow she was getting what she wanted out of it and uh, Q was just kind of like curious or whatever but uh, yeah I think I think probably if it wasn't Guinan stabbing him in the arm in the hand with a fork it was probably Cisco you know teaching him an abject lesson too um, I mean but, you know that being said though there's so many great Q moments mm -hmm. and uh, what's what's funny is uh, I, I think I was reminded that uh, you know John Delancey was only in a very very few episodes but he had such a big presence, right? He had he was such a great character and so well written overall that uh, I mean that's what you want as an actor, right? Is to be memorable, and I, I just can't wait to see what they do with him in uh, in Picard. Yeah, yeah, it'd be great, great. All right, and Matt. Oh well, uh, geez, I'm going last, so you guys have taken all the uh, all the important and deep moments. So I'll just say that what I loved about Q was the crazy situations. He, he put everyone in. Um, uh, and there's this scene in uh, Death Wish where the, the suicidal Q is trying to kill himself. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to hide from Q and he goes to all these different places. And uh, the first place they go to hide is uh, the beginning, like right before the Big Bang. And Star Trek Voyagers, for some reason, just had the funniest lines. And so Bellana just turns around and says to the captain with a complete straight face, she says, Captain, this ship will not withstand the formation of the cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> that just cracks me up every time. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> well, well uh, on that note, um, uh, thank you everyone for being a part of this. Um, again, viewers, if this is your first time hearing about this, definitely check out Star Trek Adventure is a great role playing system. Uh, tons of infinite possibilities of where your characters can go, uh, your adventures can go. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so yes, everyone. Um, again, thank you for being part of this. Thank you for those of you watching. Stay safe out there and have a good day. Take care. Mm -hmm.